Hello, and welcome to this installment of the Future Grind podcast. I am your host, Ryan O'Shea, and today I'll be speaking with Jane Metcalf, the serial entrepreneur best known as a co-founder of Wired Magazine, which she first published in 1993. Jane is now the founder and CEO of NeoLife, a digital media company seeking to do for the neobiological revolution what Wired did for the digital revolution. They accomplish this by exploring topics such as neuroscience, genetic engineering, synthetic biology, longevity, and much more. Jane has also been the president of Cho, a producer of high-end chocolates, and has made investments in numerous tech and media projects. We discuss the genesis of Wired, including how they were able to assemble an incredible early team consisting of Kevin Kelly, Nicholas Negroponte, John Battelle, and more, the similarities and differences between the digital revolution and the current neobiological revolution, what the neobiological revolution even is, and much more. This episode is brought to you by the Smart Manufacturing Experience, an event that provides solutions for applying the latest smart manufacturing technologies that drive results. Showcase your smart technologies to an audience eager for the latest innovations and know-how in Industry 4.0. Smart Manufacturing Experience focuses on additive manufacturing in 3D printing, artificial intelligence, augmented and virtual reality, automation and robotics, cybersecurity, data analytics, industrial IoT, and workforce transformation. Don't miss your chance to be a part of the Smart Manufacturing Experience, June 2nd through 4th, 2020, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Visit bit.ly forward slash SME 2020 to become an experienced partner. That's bit.ly forward slash SME 2020 to become an experienced partner. As always, show notes and links are available at futuregrind.org, where on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever podcasts are found. A video version of this episode is posted on Facebook and YouTube. Make sure to subscribe on all of these platforms, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. If you'd like to keep this podcast running, you can donate at futuregrind.org forward slash support, or you can purchase some of our newly released products at futuregrind.org forward slash store. Because of you, this is Future Grind. here with Jane. Jane, thanks for joining us. Hey, Ryan. It's great to be here. So you are, of course, a co-founder of Wired Ventures, which included Wired Magazine. And we'll certainly get into this here, but I'd love to go even before that. What is your background, and how did you come to the worlds of tech and media? Ah, okay. Well, I actually studied international affairs in college, uh, and that was sort of politics and language and geography and economics, that sort of thing. Uh, and I moved to Europe uh, to have some affairs, no, international affairs. <laughs> um, I ended up actually uh, working for a publishing startup operation uh, and then another one. And um, ultimately, that is where I met my partner, Louis Rossetto. And the two of us made a magazine which was called Electric Word. And Electric Word was about all the various technologies for um, helping people with language. And this is, you know, we were based in Amsterdam, and this was back in the 80s. Uh, and so um, the magazine was initially uh, envisioned by a translation company that did um, both translation services and software. And so for them, this was a chance to sell their products and services, but for Lewis, it was an opportunity to explore the way technology was enabling us to communicate with each other. And, you know, over the course of the few years that we published Electric Word, um, you know, the concept kept evolving to become, you know, broader and broader. And we were covering technologies like optical character recognition and speech synthesis and, you know, machine learning and neural networks. I mean, this is all back in the 80s, but it was all important because, we were talking to what we called word workers. And this was, 
in uh, direct contradiction to number crunchers. And it was sort of pre-desktop publishing. And, um, you know, those were still two very separate things. But, um, but yeah, so I, I, you know, I got involved just uh, by luck, I think, by interest and being in the right place at the right time. And then, you know, once I met Lewis, we decided to make this, you know, the thing that we really focused on. And uh, it's been an amazing thing because media has been completely transformed by technology along with everything else. So it's, it's been kind of a great way to experience life. So from Electric Word in Amsterdam, you came to California and founded Wired. What was the original vision for Wired, and how did that get started? So, you know, this magazine, Electric Word, was supported by, um, you know, a, a company that had translation services to sell. And so as a result, it was very focused on a sort of B2B mentality, like what are the technologies that our professional communicators could be using in the future? But we were coming to San Francisco and going to Macworld and figuring out desktop publishing and how to do things, you know, using technology and a lot fewer people and a lot fewer resources. And it was, I think, really coming to San Francisco and meeting the people at Macworld that kind of opened our eyes to the sort of social and political and economic changes that would be brought about by the technologies we were writing about. And the culture that surrounded this culture of innovation, you know, that was really taking off back in the 80s in, in California and in the United States more broadly. And so, you know, at a certain point, I, Lewis is the one who said, you know, we should make this a consumer magazine. And I looked at him blankly. I had literally no idea where he was going like with this. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, I got my chance to come to Macworld <laughs> that I could see what he was talking about. But it was, it was all about context, really. You know, how do you take this out of the sort of amps and wah-wah pedals that, you know, Rolling Stone would have been writing about if they'd been covering the music revolution the way computer magazines were covering the digital revolution and, you know, elevate it to talk about the people, companies, and ideas. So, you know, then, then Wired was born. And, you know, we totally pivoted from where we'd been, but where we'd been was really grounded in the technology and the applications um, but then we were able to bring in all these other aspects of, of the world, including, you know, politics and economics and, and so forth. And so we decided to move to America because trying to, you know, raise risk capital for such an outrageous idea in Europe in the 80s really made no sense at all. It, there, that just wasn't going to happen. And on top of that, being able to operate in a country where there's one language and one currency and you know, much cheaper telecommunications costs and so forth made sense. So we decided to uh, to move to America. We arrived with, you know, 29 boxes and a business plan, just like our immigrant parents had probably, and moved out to California and took as many calls and meetings as we possibly could, faced relentless rejection for two solid years. But every day, we got up and found yet more evidence of how the world was going to be transformed. And we saw this, you know, not just in the technology sphere or the business sphere, um, you know, but we could see it playing out in cultural trends and social awareness and so forth. But it's just nobody was piecing it together and giving you that bigger picture across all these different domains. So we had a prototype. And um, as long as I had a list of people to call in the morning, you know, I was happy. <laughs> and we just uh, kept accumulating evidence that this revolution was coming and kept accumulating people that we thought, you know, should be interested or cared or were deeply involved or what have you. And ultimately, um, we convinced Nicholas Negroponte, who was the founder of the Media Lab at MIT, to write us a check. And, you know, what he refers to as an act of bravado um, offered to actually help us raise the money. And that really changed everything. I mean, to have somebody of that stature, not only as your first investor, but also as your biggest champion, really kind of changed the course of, of history for us. Yeah, you mentioned that you initially faced rejection after rejection because people did not share your vision. And your vision, of course, ended up being accurate. But during this time, you were able to assemble an amazing team of founders and investors and editors. How did you assemble this team? What was your pitch to them that, for example, in the case of Kevin Kelly, led them to put other projects on hold to help launch Wired? 
So Kevin was a special example. Um, you know, we had exchanged subscriptions. Um, he gave us a subscription to Whole Earth Catalog, and in exchange, we gave him a subscription to Electric Word. So he did a review of Electric Word, and he called it the least boring computer magazine in the world. <laughs> and we were so touched by that. And I remember, you know, we were trying to, to raise money for Electric Word to keep it going. And we ended up at a, now you will appreciate this, at a virtual reality conference in 1989 wow. <laughs> in Amsterdam. And um, John Perry Barlow, who at the time was a lyricist for the Grateful Dead, who was playing around with computers, was there with Timothy Leary. And I handed them a copy of the magazine. And Timothy Leary said, oh, electric word, the least boring computer magazine in the world. And, <laughs> you know, we said, can we quote you? <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Anyway, so Kevin, uh, you know, ended up opening doors for us in, in so many different ways. But when we moved to California, you know, we looked him up and said, you know, we're, we're here and we're evolving this thing into something that will appeal to a broader audience and a more consumer audience. And, you know, you're brilliant and, you know, you've been supportive and we just want to come and chat and, you know, exchange ideas. And, you know, if you've got any ways you, you can imagine to help us, let us know. And you know, ultimately through the course of the conversation, we said, you know, we're going to be looking for an editor, you know, or editors plural to help us with this. Uh, do you have any suggestions? And he completely blew us away by saying, how about me? Because at the time, you know, he was the editor in chief of the whole earth, which was huge. And it was the well, which was the, um, you know, the online component, which was one of the formidable and formative early online communities. And he was getting ready to take a sabbatical to finish his book, Out of Control. Um, and so for him to say, how about me? It's like, aren't you a little busy? But we didn't even question that. It's like, if he was going to come with us, we were going to do whatever it took to get his engagement and involvement. So yeah, he, we never even imagined asking him, um, but he offered. And, you know, it, it, was, it was an extraordinary thing. Um, you know, the next person who joined us was John Battelle. And he came referred to us uh, via a, a mutual startup publishing friend that we met in Paris. And he had just graduated, uh, gotten his master's in journalism and was working for a newspaper, I think, at the time. And uh, when he had written his thesis for uh, Berkeley's J School, uh, it was essentially the same idea as Wired. I think he wanted to come at it um, you know, from a solidly business point of view, whereas ours was always, you know, business and culture. But nevertheless, somebody said, you know, you ought to meet this guy. Lewis met him first. I was in New York at the time. And so, you know, he came and knocked on the door. And when I opened the door and, and this guy walks in, he starts telling me what Wired is as if he knew it as well as I did. And that was a that was a truly uh, extraordinary moment. Cause up until that point, I kept having to explain to people, no, it's not that intellectual or it's not that arty or it's not that technical. Cause every time somebody explained it, they would just, you know, try and imagine it, but it, nothing like that had existed before. And so they kept not quite getting it. And John Battelle was the first person who, you know, really got it and explained it, uh, in a way that, you know, brought his ideas into it as well. And then from there, I mean, those net, the two networks they had, Negroponte's network, our own network with the magazine, you know, then it just became this accelerant. You know, it was just, it, it was such a compelling idea. The timing was so right. The, you know, positioning and the strategy of how we were going to go about it just felt fresh and young and energetic and hip. And, you know, it really captured like all the aspects of, you know, the, the people and the visions that these people designing these tools had for the future. So, yeah, it was one of those great things. You know, I, I like to uh, harken back to Victor Hugo, who said, there's nothing so great as an idea whose time has come. And, you know, when I look back on the startup journey and the two years it took us to get the first issue out the door, you know, those were important years. And a very smart publisher once said, you know, I see what you're doing, but are you a year ahead of your time? Because if you are, it's going to cost you a million dollars more. He said, are you two years ahead of your time? Because that's going to cost you $5 million more. And 
you know, the fact that we hit the newsstand the day Bill Clinton and Al Gore got inaugurated was just sheer dumb luck. Because Al Gore, of course, was running around talking about the information superhighway, and nobody knew what that was. And so suddenly, here's Wired with metallic and neon inks and, you know, some hip-looking imagery and a lot of attitude. And the national media, I think, was just smitten right from the start. And that obviously had a big impact. It did. It did have a big impact. And you mentioned timing there. And timing is certainly important. And in retrospect, it looks like the timing was right for Wired. Wired came online just as the computer culture of the Bay Area exploded from niche communities of early adopters and business people to what became a global digital revolution. And Wired grew in much the same way. So in both of these cases, it moved from niche communities of early adopters to a cultural phenomena. But who was part of this early Wired audience? Who did you target? So we were always really clear that the people we've most wanted to communicate with were the people actually building the digital revolution. You know, the people who were the developers of the tools and the early adopters of those tools. Um, and so that, I think, we never wavered in our focus. Obviously, 25 years on, uh, the world has changed and, you know, the positioning has changed. But, you know, we were really clear that what we wanted was to basically show the nerds who they were and how cool they are and how powerful they are and to really give them, you know, the opportunity to um, climb out of the basement, you know, and, uh, and assume some responsibility for, you know, the future of the planet. And so, you know, we marketed initially to them, but because we were looking for the early adopters, we also kind of handpicked our audience you know, the TED conference had just launched and the founder, Richard Saul Worman, was a, a good friend of ours and a, and a big supporter of what we were trying to do. And we were fans and supporters of TED. And, you know, that was a technology, entertainment and design community. And, you know, so we were going after these communities from graphic designers to entertainment people to film school, we were looking at um, economics, we were looking at education, we were looking at, you know, civic government. And, you know, we had a very targeted strategy of going to the Sundance Film Festival and the Consumer Electronics Show, but also, you know, the, the big computer shows, Macworld and PC World and all that sort of thing, in a way to reach across to as many audiences as possible, looking within each audience for the forward thinking, innovative people who weren't afraid of technology and wanted to be change agents, could see what they could do, you know, with these new tools and then had, you know, the moxie to, to actually make it happen. So you were deeply involved with media starting in the 80s and lasting through the 90s when Wired was ultimately sold to Condé Nast. But you've been largely separate from it for well over a decade before deciding to return to this world with a new publication called Neolife. What is Neolife, and what is it focused on? So Neolife is very inspired by Wired um, because I realized at a certain moment that what I was experiencing and, and curious about had so many similar feelings to what I was experiencing in the 80s prior to the run-up of the digital revolution. And you know what happened was I became very interested in health for a variety of reasons. I'd had my own struggles with health, but when my parents started to experience cognitive decline as well as a uh, breakdown in mental health. So I started just researching, you know, what, what can I do to help my parents? You know, I'd already started thinking a lot about my own health and of course, raising children, you know, the mom tends to be the chief medical officer of the family. So I'd also been involved in the food business and been thinking about how food impacts health. And so, you know, when my parents were sick, I thought, well, let's see what's out there. And what I discovered was how technology has just blown up what is happening in health sphere and in biology, you know, and life sciences writ large. And I met people at the forefront of genetics and neuroscience and longevity studies and the microbiome. And, you know, they all had the same story, which is, 
you know, for years I've been interested in this, but it wasn't until advanced imaging came along or big data or machine learning or 3D printing or neurostimulation, you know, or whatever the technology was that suddenly unlocked this ability to see and understand the biological systems they were working with so much better. And, you know, I was, I was initially just curious, you know, for the benefit of my parents and my family and myself. And then, and then I just was curious because it was just so incredibly interesting and so seemingly powerful. And then I got really curious that after a relatively short amount of time paying attention to all these different fields, I was telling experts in one field things they didn't know about advances in another field. And it really hit home when I went to a conference at Singularity University. And as usual, I'm lurking in the background while all these MDs and PhDs, you know, are presenting their research. And, you know, people are trying to draw me out. Well, who are you and why are you here? And when I started talking about how this all fit together into a bigger picture, they were surprised. And I was kind of flabbergasted that they needed somebody to translate what was happening. And what I realized is the problem so many of our advanced life science researchers um, have to deal with is that the more advanced they become in their field, the deeper into their field they get and the less bandwidth they have for tracking what's happening in other fields. And, you know, there's an explosion of discovery and innovation and publication. Uh, and it's really all they can do to keep up with their own field. And what I want to do is find the people who instead of going narrower as they get deeper into their careers are going in the opposite direction. You know, they're going broader and they're looking across these disciplines and across these fields and figuring out how what they know can benefit uh, something in a different field. And so, you know, the people who have medical backgrounds, but then, you know, become computer programmers who are now working with, you know, big data sets or something, or the materials engineer, you know, who starts working in biology, uh, you know, these people bring a beginner's mind to the problems and can bring new solutions. And it's, it's really important that people be willing to be novices in another field because, the, you know, the way the real breakthroughs are going to happen are, are if we have people who can operate across multiple disciplines. And so, you know, once I realized that, it was like, you know, I, I kind of know how to do this. I kind of know how to handpick an audience and pull it together into a community that will have, you know, a lot of power and influence going forward. And that can really shape how this all happens. So at that point, I thought, you know, media is still a pretty good way of doing that. And then the other part of it is I basically just couldn't help myself. <laughs> there were just, there were so many amazing people and so many great stories to tell that, you know, I just wanted to start telling those stories. And that's great to hear because I run into this problem of siloed experts quite a bit. I come across people, often academics, who are doing incredible work at the forefront of their fields, and they are completely unaware of someone else doing similar research Sometimes yep. even within a different department of the same university. Yeah. And I sometimes have to be the one that makes these introductions and connects these dots. Exactly. And that just amazes me. So when I see this, it's clear that there's not a commons for the sharing of ideas. And that eliminates the possibility of the collaboration that I think we really need to drive progress. So I'm very happy to see that you're out here establishing these connections with Neolife. But I have to ask... Where did that name, Neolife, come from? So back to Kevin Kelly. Uh, I was casting about for what to call this thing. And I glanced up onto my shelf and his book was there, which he'd written 25 years earlier. I think I pulled it out because I wanted to reread it for some reason. Maybe it was because, you know, we were coming up to the 25th anniversary of Wired. So I pulled it out and the first few pages were so resonant with um, with what I was thinking about at that point. Whereas when he wrote it 25 years earlier, I had no clue what he was talking about, and it, uh, it really wasn't. Um, but I picked it up, and he talked about that the subtitle of the book, it was called Out of Control, Fast Forward into a Neobiological Civilization. And it just struck me, this is new biology. It's a new way of thinking about biology. And it's, you know, bringing the mindset of an engineer and the tool set of an engineer, 
you know, to the very organic and messy process of, of life. And, um, and so I was, I was so inspired by that that we decided to call it Neolife. And then my partner, Lewis, at the time was registering a, a bunch of new domain names for me and the children. You know, would you like to be, you know, Jane.ninja or, you know, something along those lines? And he said, hey, did you know life is a domain name? Dot life. And I thought, now that's it. That's it. It was just too good. I mean, so it's neo.life. It's not neolife.com because, you know, if you're talking about life sciences, dot life is just better. Yeah, I'm kind of concerned that these new domain extensions might confuse some people, but neo.life, I think, is a great example of a perfect use of this. It also means you can include your web address in your branding without it looking out of place, which is a great benefit as well. So you use the term neobiological revolution there, which can be compared to the digital revolution that Wired was founded to cover. What would you say are the similarities between these two revolutions? And how might they be different? I've been asking myself that same question, and I want everyone around me to constantly help me you know, think that through because I don't want to fall into the pit of repeating what I've already done. But, you know, the, the digital revolution was, you know, what Stuart Brand likes to say, when a new technology comes out, you know, you're either part of the steamroller or you're part of the road. So the digital revolution was really about letting people know this was coming, helping them understand why and how it would impact them and what they could do with it to make their lives better or the lives of people around them better. And, you know, we were extremely enthusiastic about it when the internet and, and the uh, graphic user interface for the web became available. You know, it was sort of all in full steam ahead. Whatever is good for the internet is good for everybody. And that was what we called the digital revolution, was connecting people up and, you know, giving people access to all the world's information and providing, you know, alternative communities to the ones that you may have been born into on the off chance that you didn't just fit perfectly into that geographic community. I mean, it was just an incredibly exciting opportunity to uh, completely rethink our education, the way we did business, to kind of flatten hierarchies, you know, to allow real meritocracy to emerge as opposed to, you know, the aristocracy and the monarchies and, you know, preserving the power of the elites. This was really a way to completely upend that and let, you know, the smartest, most dedicated people with the best ideas and those, that doesn't have to be the same person, right? It could be a great idea over here, may not be the smartest person, but it's a great idea. So they get their opportunity to have impact. And so, you know, when I was at these conferences, I was realizing I used to think that computer engineers were the most powerful people in the world. But then I met these MDs and PhDs who, in addition to their digital skills, had, you know, 15 years of deep learning about, you know, the very complex biological systems that they have to work within. And, you know, with these tools, whether it's, you know, gene editing or neurostimulation or immune system, you know, hijacking, you know, whatever it is, it's like, that's even more powerful because now we're actually altering evolution. And so to me, it felt extremely similar and yet, same tool, sort of like it's, this is the next phase of the digital revolution. But by that point, you know, we were starting to confront some of the negative impacts of the digital revolution. And so I was like, well, what do we need to do differently this time? And what are the cautionary tales that we can study? And where could this go wrong? And the bottom line is, we're talking about the difference between life and death. And so the risk-reward ratio is quite different in neobiological revolution. You know, the equivalent of a dream drive would be, you know, just build it and they will come or something. You know, we, we're not going to worry too much about the hows and the whys and the, and the therefores. We just know that this is important. This is going to advance the game. And, it, you know, we'll figure it out later. But you can't do that with a gene drive. You know, the systems are far too complex and have been evolving over the course of millennia. And so, you know, you, you really can't move fast and break things. So to me, it's just more nuanced and more complex, but ultimately more powerful. Yeah, biotech is certainly not an area where we can afford to move fast and break things, especially when we're dealing with healthcare, gene drives, neuroscience, and other topics in which we lack a full understanding of the consequences. 
And that's a big shift for many traditional entrepreneurs who want to get to testing and commercialization as quickly as possible. There is a certain amount of responsibility and due diligence that's required here. And that, of course, has to be balanced with the other values such as personal liberty and democratized access. So the stakes for this do seem to be higher. And I'm sure that much of my audience is familiar with NeoLife, but for those who might not be, what are a few examples of the stories and subjects that you typically cover? Sure. Uh, so we've covered a, a biohacker. Actually, his name is Ono Faber, and he was a web developer and an app developer until he was diagnosed with a, an extremely rare cancer called neurofibromatosis. And it was threatening his hearing and his eyesight and ultimately his balance and mobility. And so he basically took his, um, his experience, you know, as a, as a software engineer and decided to apply that to biology. And so he hooked up with a friend who happened to be a molecular biologist and, you know, did a, a genomic hackathon. And, you know, I just... I love the stories of people who are taking responsibility for their own health and recognizing how democratizing these tools can be and just kind of fearlessly, you know, plow into biology, trying to figure out how they can help themselves and other patients like them. You know, the story of the open insulin project where people are trying to reverse engineer essentially insulin because it's extremely expensive. And, you know, how can we help diabetics get more control over their lives at less expense? So you've got an effort to make insulin less expensive, which is a project over at Counterculture Labs in Oakland. But you also have a number of people with diabetes creating this looping system where they basically have an artificial pancreas and an insulin pump delivery mechanism and a loop so that as your blood sugar levels drop, your sensor can pick that up. It can tell you when to administer more insulin, and then it can measure that insulin again so that you are now regulated and you don't have to be calling other people to alert them to the fact that your, your levels are low. And this is, you know, open source technology with thousands of people using this old, uh, prior generation Medtronic's device along with a Raspberry Pi. So that stuff is really cool. But, you know, I'm also interested in advanced research at, you know, Harvard and MIT and Berkeley and, and UCSF. You know, we're, uh, we have a story coming up in uh, our book that we're getting ready to publish by a scientist named Steve Ramirez, who's been injecting neurons with a protein that allows the neuron to be manipulated using light. And so with that, he's able to actually manipulate our memories so he can diminish the impact of a traumatic memory. He can help recapture lost memories, and he can even implant new memories. So it's, a, it's an extraordinarily powerful technology with all sorts of implications from, you know, the brain machine computer interface to, you know, the ethical concerns about how we use this. And, you know, it's one thing to help an Alzheimer's patient recover lost memory. You know, it's something quite, again, to relieve PTSD for people. But what happens when we actually use that to make our soldiers more immune to the horrors of war? So, you know, these things all are on a spectrum, so to speak. And, um, you know, to me, that's just incredibly interesting. But, you know, basically, we like to write about people, companies, and ideas. And there's no shortage of that on the neobiological frontier. You mentioned that some of this can be found in your upcoming book. And this book is actually an exciting new development for you that is just now being publicly announced. So tell us a bit more about this. What does this book consist of? And where can people find out more? So the book is called Neo Life, 25 Visions for the Future of Our Species. And um, the way it came about was I started asking these scientists, you know, George Church and this man, Steve Ramirez and Ed Boyden, um, you know, people at the absolute bleeding edge of genetic engineering and brain manipulation and imaging. And, you know, I was like, what is it that you can do with all these tools and how will that transform us going forward? And 
what picture do you have in your mind of what we look like when all of these tools are available? You know, what, what does future homo sapiens look like? And I was coming at it from a place of, first of all, living in Silicon Valley, where I'm surrounded by computer scientists and engineers. And, you know, the conversation is, you know, dominated by robotics and artificial intelligence. And while I'm following that in those developments, I keep coming back to the fact that I'm sitting here in a sack of, you know, blood and, and bones and, uh, and, and flesh. And we've had uh, embodied uh, hominids for a very, very, very long time. And, you know, the future, we, we get enslaved or, uh, you know, we become batteries or we're pets or something. But it's like, I just, I don't see that happening because we're doing so many things on the biological front at the same time. And I just wanted to tip the conversation more towards that side of things, um, less about computer science and more about how our new tools will enhance us as human beings, not as AIs. And so it led to a series of, of conversations, you know, usually over dinner, occasionally, uh, you know, sort of an unconference within another conference. And, you know, the conversations were incredibly interesting. And I think really inspiring for the scientists and, and artists and science fiction writers who were involved. But we never came to an answer. There, was, there wasn't a vision. In other words, you know, I think with the digital revolution, we had a really clear vision. I had a really clear vision. And in fact, I have children who are 20 and 22 years old now. And so they basically are the product of the digital revolution that started in the 80s. And yeah, there's plenty of things that surprise me, but in many respects, you know, they, they are the product of what we envisioned 25 years ago. So that was what we set out to do with this book, was see if we could envision what life would be like, what humans would be like, what choices we would be offered, what dilemmas we'd be confronted with, you know, what would be fabulous and what might be not so great. But, you know, with a very conscious intention of creating positive visions for the future of our species because you know the headlines are so dominated by dystopias and our popular culture is dominated by dystopias and it reminds me a lot of what life was like in the late 80s and early 90s you know i think we get in trouble as a society when we no longer envision a positive future and you know when we were at wired we very deliberately set about celebrating that which is great, which seems like a way forward, which feels like a best practice. And, you know, it just, it's so easy to take pot shots at something that's stupid or not working. And I think, you know, lots of media will make their bread and butter doing that day in and day out, being skeptical. And, you know, that's, that's part of journalism. And, you know, we are still completely devoted to journalistic values, but, you know, in our sense, we're less about covering everything that happens every day in our field, and more about selecting those things that matter, those things that are important, those things that seem to indicate a good direction to be moving in. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do with you know, life in general and, and specifically with this book. Yeah, I think we're at an inflection point in human history in which the decisions we make today and over the coming years might really determine the path we take as a species. And that's a pretty bold statement, but I do think it's true. And there are a lot of people putting forth their visions for the future. Some dystopian, as you said, but others maybe unrealistically utopian. And the Neolife book seems to be a great way to explore some of these visions for the future of humanity, and the paths we could take. So I will definitely provide more information in the show notes at futuregrind.org for anyone who wants to find out more. But this gets into one of my major concerns, and that is the media coverage that I see of these topics, particularly when it comes to biology and citizen science. Much of the coverage of biohackers and the human augmentation community focuses on fear-mongering and sensationalism, featuring clickbait headlines and misleading photos. Meanwhile, often coverage of advances in medical science have the opposite problem. We get some promising results in early-stage animal models, and media headlines make it sound as though a cure for cancer, or Alzheimer's, or some other ailment is about to be approved and made available. 
I see both of these things, the fear-mongering and the overselling, as forms of clickbait sensationalism. And when we're in an ad revenue-supported attention economy, it's hard to see this changing. Are these problems that you've noticed as well, and how does Neolife avoid falling into this trap? Absolutely. It's a tragedy, really, that communicating the nuances of science is so tricky and requires so much knowledge and adeptness. And I'm thrilled by, for instance, all the possibilities that synthetic biology hold in store for us for generating alternative energy sources, new fuels, new uh, new ways of producing proteins that are gentler on the environment and on animals, new materials, you know, in addition to all the biological benefits and medical benefits that, uh, that they promise. And yet it's still something that has yet to really scale that, you know, costs a lot of money and in some cases has um, some not so healthy outputs as part of the manufacturing process, at least at this stage. So how do you get people excited and moving in that direction without overselling it and creating an ultimate backlash against something that isn't quite ready for prime time? You know, the Alzheimer's cure, the longevity, you know, aid, the, you know, fix your sleep, have better sex, you know, increase your productivity, you know, the stem cell clinics. I mean, all of these things promise a lot. The, the trick is to know how much and how soon. So how do you explain what a breakthrough is if it's not something the consumer can go out and buy tomorrow and have an immediate impact with? There are lots of schools that have um, good science communications programs, and it's typically a master's degree that you would get after either doing a journalism undergraduate degree or science undergraduate degree. And I'm hugely optimistic about the people coming out of those programs. But on the flip side is where do they get a chance to actually publish their work? And, you know, at that point, you have to look at the media landscape, which, you know, Mass media is still interested in clickbait. And so, you know, the, the nuance that we take uh, the time to explain, it, it, you know, fact checkers are the things that get cut at publications. In fact, one of the things that I like about Lorene Powell Jobs, who bought The Atlantic, is that, you know, she put 20 fact checkers back on staff. Fact checking really matters. People don't have time to go back um, and read your correction. You know, they read it once and that's their fact, even though it's wrong. So, you know, doing fact checking in science publishing is really time consuming and requires highly knowledgeable uh, and well-educated people. And so your major media outlet that has to put up 25 to 50 to 100 stories a day, you know, does, simply doesn't have the time to do that fact checking. You know, by the same token, the more mainstream cultural and lifestyle oriented publications think their audiences don't care and therefore it doesn't matter. We're just not going to give them that much detail. But, you know, God is in the details, and especially when you're talking about biology. And so I think we need to create alternative platforms where people who are willing to invest a little more time in creating the content and a little more time in understanding it as the reader is really the way to go. And I talk to really brilliant scientists who want to get their message to the public. And so they dumb down their research and they make it, you know, this mass market paperback. But I think it's a really missed opportunity to educate people and to invite people into a more complex understanding of their own bodies than their own biological systems. So, I mean, that that's my answer. First of all, train people up. But secondly, provide outlets for the kind of coverage that allows for a more nuanced and detail-oriented understanding of the science that we need, because we are making these choices right now. We will be confronted with whether or not to do a gene drive for malaria or Lyme disease. We'll be confronted with whether or not to do a gene edit to enhance our own longevity or disease resistance. You know, the tech companies here in Silicon Valley are offering women the chance to freeze their eggs we found out that sperm ages as well. And of course, the decline in sperm count among men is a little bit alarming. So maybe men should freeze their sperm. And maybe the cost and the pain and the emotional distress of in vitro fertilization is going to get better. And, you know, maybe we'll all just deal with frozen embryos at that point. And 
you know, why wouldn't you do a pre-implantation genetic screening of those embryos? And, you know, once you do, why not select the ones less likely to show, you know, some kind of mental anguish or some other form of physical malady? Or, or if they have a, a rare gene manifestation of a mutation, then perhaps you edit that. So, I mean, I think all of these things are literally happening right now at our fingertips. I mean, in the United States, only between one and 2% of all live births are conceived through in vitro fertilization. So I think it's like you know, 65,000 babies a year. But, you know, in, in Northern European countries, that could be as high as four or 5%. You know, if IVF becomes more affordable, that number could start to shift. And, you know, we could significantly reduce the disease burden on our societies by not bringing children with damaging mutations into the world in the first place. Uh, but then, you know, what effect does that have if there's fewer people who are bipolar? You know, how does that change our society? So, you know, these changes and, and decisions are being made, not just in America, of course, but all over the world. And, you know, I would argue that the people's choices in China and India might have a bigger impact than what we choose for our offspring and ourselves in America or Western Europe. So I just, I believe very strongly that it's our responsibility as 21st century citizens to educate ourselves and to be in a position to guide the conversations and to help shape the moral arguments, you know, both for and against these types of biological interventions. And, you know, we, we talk about this in the book, you know, it's, we, we, we've broken it down into product roadmaps, which are the science and the technology that's going to transform our species, creative briefs, which are sort of the guidelines for an equitable and ethical future and a desirable future. And then dreams, which is, you know, artists and writers just sort of dreaming and imagining, you know, what the future might be with both, you know, positive and potentially um, scary consequences. But I think this is really important for people to do is to imagine where we're going. And it's hard. I mean, 25 years ago, could we possibly have imagined that the Russians would try and hijack the U.S. election? <laughs> you know, it's like impossible to envision. So what are those things that we can't envision? Because the things we can are already challenging enough. So, yeah, I think I think we need to learn and understand, you know, maybe not at the level of a Ph.D., but in broad enough terms that we can have informed debate about this because the scientists don't want to make these choices. You know, they've been making a lot of the technology based choices for humanity, you know, for a very long time. But, you know, I know many scientists who feel like these are individual choices, but they're also obviously uh, impacting by the government regulation and, you know, the world health organization and so forth. So it's a very interesting time to study biology. Yeah, and some of the things you brought up there are extremely controversial, like genetic modification and attempts to eradicate conditions that some might deem undesirable. And what does that mean for neurodiversity? And whose voices should be included in these conversations? And are there some voices that we shouldn't include? All of these issues are contentious, and Neolife is on the front lines of where these debates are being held. So how does a publication such as yours cover these often subjective, contentious, value-based issues in a way that you deem responsible. How do you approach that? <laughs> I wanted to, when I first, honestly, when I first started out, I thought, let's do a manifesto for, you know, the future of Homo sapiens. Let's get everybody's input and we'll come up with something we can all agree upon. And we will publish that as a sort of, you know, declaration of, uh, of the future. And, and, and that was, immediately the worst idea I had ever had <laughs> because there's no way that I could do that. I mean, this is so culturally based and it's so value based and it's so geographically influenced, you know, it's your economic interests, it's your, you know, religious beliefs, it's your historic ethnicity. So one of the things that came out of this was the recognition that you know, if there is a manifesto, the first and most important credo of the manifesto would have to be a commitment to diversity in every shape, way, shape and form. You know, there are plenty of people who believe that, um, you know, if given the opportunity to genetically engineer our children, we will all want tall, smart, athletic, blonde, 
you know, blonde haired, blue eyed people. And I'm at, actually not worried about that at all. I mean, I, uh, I have a friend who, uh, who's gay, who once told me that, um, he likes dark, hairy men. Um, you know, there are people in the deaf community who welcome additional deaf babies into their community. Um, you know, we know what the benefits of neurodiversity are and, you know, by consequence, what would happen if we eliminate the people who are, you know, on an autism spectrum, you know, we might wipe out a large percentage of our, you know, science and engineering class. If we eliminate bipolar disorder, we might wipe out a large percentage of our creative and, and cultural class. So, you know, we have to recognize the fact that there is no one ideal and that diversity is, you know, probably the safest way forward. You know, as a former chocolate uh, manufacturer, I know that when they cut down the polyculture, um, you know, jungles where the cacao trees used to grow and planted one, you know, genetically engineered crop across, you know, many, many, many hectares, uh, it was far more susceptible to, um, to disease than if they grew, I mean, genetically modified or not, but just grew those crops in a polyculture environment. You know, adaptability and survivability depend on diversity, and that's the best way to future-proof our species. So what's the business model for Neolife? It's free to subscribe to, and the content is freely accessible. So how do you monetize? Well, I need to figure that out because uh, I've been doing this as a labor of love, and, um, you know, it's time to make it a business. And one thing I know, people will buy your books. And so that's why I thought that capturing some of this in a book would be a good move um, for two reasons, not just because I can get paid for books, but also because I think these ideas are important. And I think these people are important and the science is important and it's foundational and stuff that flies in and out of your inbox, you know, or, oh, I remember that web page. What was it again? You know, this is something that I think of as a time capsule. And I want us to be able to sort of have this be accessible information. You know, it's beautifully designed with full color imagery. The designer is Jennifer Morla, who is a National Design Award winner and also a dear friend. So I think books and other formats of publication uh, that people pay for uh, is definitely part of our future. Um, I'm also extremely excited about, you know, what happens when you get people from different fields together. And so I want to start doing more events. We haven't done paid events in the past, but that's something that we want to start doing in the future. And so we'll do probably uh, one in San Francisco and one in Boston around the book launch. And then, you know, I'd be very interested in uh, coming to other parts of the country with this message uh, and tapping into, you know, the different audiences that we can uh, learn from and also exchange ideas with. So, you know, I think ultimately it will be like any media company, um, sort of a variety of income streams, um, but all geared around ideas and community. So what stories are you following now? What's in development or in its early stages that you think we're going to be hearing a lot more about? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think electricity is really interesting and bioelectronic medicine is something that, you know, we're just starting to see the possibilities of. Um, so I definitely think that is coming down the path. Um, the Human Cell Atlas is a really interesting project to map all the different types of cells in the body. And I think, you know, the fact that we don't even know that yet just shows how ignorant we still are. But as we begin to figure that out, I think there are huge implications for, um, for health and medicine. I'm super excited about digital therapeutics. I mean, the mind is so powerful. And if we can retrain the mind to think less about our pain or to feel less pain um, or to improve our focus or to improve our ability to comply with medication protocols, you know, I think digital therapeutics is a huge opportunity that we are just scratching the surface of. And, you know, who wouldn't rather do that than put some chemical in your body. You know, I think there's big opportunity there. I think there's new forms of gene editing coming down the pike. I mean, there's different enzymes besides Cas9. Um, there's base editing, which is far more specific um, and, and hopefully more precise and less error prone. Yeah. I mean, I think, 
I, I'm waiting for quantum computing. I mean, I think the impacts on health are just staggering. So um, uh, those are just the few that I'm thinking about. So we brought up food a few times in passing in this conversation, but I think we should turn to that more deliberately now. You, of course, were an entrepreneur in the chocolate industry and have been looking into the health and environmental impacts of food for a while. And these are also topics in which there are a lot of competing opinions and a lot of seemingly contradictory data. So could you perhaps give us an idea of how you view these issues and maybe how that has informed your dietary choices, or how you think of the food industry more broadly? Sure. Um, so I don't have a lot of religion around food, and I did at various points, points in my life. Um, I recognized that because of some basically mechanical conditions in my body that I don't process grains, wheat and grains well. I'm not celiac, I'm not gluten sensitive, but I just don't eat grains and, and carbs. I'm not saying that's what everybody should do. I'm not trying to be Atkins or paleo or anything else. It's just, you know, over the course of a lifetime, you figure out what makes you feel best. So I just like meat, fish, and vegetables. That's what the bulk of what I consume consists of. You know, I, I love vegetables. It's just, I love them, always have, always will. And if I can grow them, even better. And so um, I was harvesting my cherry tomatoes yesterday. They're insane. They're so sweet. They're like candy. Um, I hate sugar. I've never processed sugar well. It makes my teeth hurt. It makes me feel bad. I'm super sensitive to caffeine. It doesn't just make me jittery. It actually jumbles my thoughts so that I literally can't think straight, can't hold a, a train of thought, which is completely bizarre. So you know, and, I, and I'm always thirsty, so I drink water because everything else has either sugar or caffeine in it, it seems. And so, uh, you know, I've made my own way through. I've certainly sequenced my microbiome and I've tried to understand how my food choices are impacting my gut. I think over the course of the last couple of years, it's become clear to me that we really don't know. <laughs> um, and so I'm not spending a huge amount of time trying to track that anymore. I am interested in epigenetic changes. And there's this company in the UK called Chronomics, which will actually track your epigenetic changes for you so that you can make changes to your diet and lifestyle and get your results back quickly enough to actually see what the impact is. I mean, I think the, the sequencing lag times is, is a real deterrent. But in fact, we have a story coming up about somebody who says, you know, trying to do a fecal transplant right now is like giving somebody a blood transfusion without understanding their different classes of blood, of blood types. So I don't get too wrapped up around that. I think, you know, the goal is to eat as wide a variety of things as possible and everything in moderation uh, and mostly plants. I'm sort of a Michael Pollan camp on that. In terms of thinking beyond myself and in and, and terms more of, of food systems, you know, I firmly believe that there is no one perfect diet, that you can give very general guidelines. But once we figure out the microbiome and the genome of each individual, you know, the real promise of precision medicine is that we can then give ourselves the fuel that will optimize for, you know, energy and um, clear thinking and sleep and the stuff that will enable us to live to be 125. Because I do, I do believe that what you put in your body has more impact than almost any other factor, unless you're in some incredibly toxic environment. But for normal people under normal conditions, I think the single biggest opportunity we have for impacting our health is through diet. Um, I am not alarmed by a proliferation of genetically modified foods. I believe that the 2,000 studies that they've done that show no adverse effects on human health uh, mean that we should not be concerned about GMOs in terms of human health. I think there are still economic issues and, um, you know, other environmental issues that require the same rigorous research to disprove. But I think the promise of genetically modified foods for reducing the amount of land we need, the amount of water we need, uh, the amount of pesticides, the amount of fertilizers that we need far outweigh the environmental impacts that could be caused. So, Again, I, you know, more research needed and, you know, these things are still evolving. But I just abhor things like the GMO project 
that go around and slap a non-GMO label on foods for which there is no GMO alternative. I think it really plays to fear mongering. And I think it obfuscates a complex issue. Nutrition and agriculture are complex systems. And, you know, to I, I'll never forget the Whole Foods buyer telling me I should say, you know, gluten free on my chocolate bars and no trans fats. It's like, but there's no gluten in chocolate. Why would I put that on my packaging? It's just, it's this kind of mentality that confuses people. And, you know, I asked a brilliant neuroscientist, David Eagleman, uh, who's amazing. Um, you should totally interview him if he happens. Um, but I asked him one time, which he thought was more complicated, neuroscience or nutrition. And he paused for no more than a split second before saying, oh, nutrition, definitely. <laughs> you know, it's, and there's so much we don't know. It's like millions of years of food evolving, millions of years of hominids evolving. You know, the bacteria within us are also evolving. You know, now layer on your immune system and your genetics and everything else on top of all of that. And how can you understand, you know, whether you need three servings of grains or five or none? You know, I just think trying to be prescriptive makes no sense. And so... What we do know is that we cannot scale our existing agriculture to feed our populations in the year 2050. No question about that. It's just not feasible and it's not desirable. And what if we, you know, instead use synthetic biology and genetic modification to actually produce more nutritious proteins for us using fewer of our ecological inputs and start rewilding the planet? You know, let's turn agriculture back into the wild and you know, plant more trees and have more um, space for other animals, you know, bring back our ecological diversity. To me, that's the promise. So, you know, if that's the vision, yeah, let's recognize the pitfalls along the way, but let's, let's move forward towards that. So as we begin to wrap things up here, I, I'm interested to find out what else beside Neolife you have going on and what's next for you. Well, I have been invited to participate in any number of extraordinary initiatives. There's something called the Human Vaccine Project, which is an effort to basically decode the human immunome, you know, which is probably a thousand times more complex than the genome. And, you know, I've been involved in uh, the Bergruen Institute's uh, plans for future humans. So I'm, I'm interested in the uh, a variety of different initiatives that are, you know, bold and audacious and incredibly ambitious, because that's when you have to bring all these different people together to really make progress. Uh, so yeah, so I'm focused on that. Um, I'm separately trying to stay as healthy as I can and avoid aging too fast or unnecessarily. Uh, so I spend some time thinking about that. Yeah. And of course, I have other non-professional interests, but... I, I, I have to say, there's so much happening on the biological front that it does tend to color everything I do, you know, what I eat and how I live and my work and, um, you know, my, my wishes for the future. Well, I don't think that the neobiological revolution is going anywhere, and I'm so glad that you and Neolife are here to cover it. And Jane, this has been one of those conversations that every topic we touched on could have easily been a full podcast episode itself. <laughs> and because of this, I didn't even come close to being able to bring up all of the topics I wanted to. But the good news is that I'm sure that many of these things are going to be covered by Neolife and perhaps mentioned in your new book. So I'd encourage everyone in my audience to check those out. You can, of course, find out more at futuregrind.org. And Jane, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Ryan. It was great to be with you. Hey, everyone. Ryan O'Shea again. And thanks for listening to my interview with Jane Metcalf. Remember to check out the show notes and more at futuregrind.org. Make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. We also need your help to keep this podcast running. You can donate at futuregrind.org forward slash support or make a purchase at futuregrind.org forward slash store. Once again, we want to thank our sponsor, the Smart Manufacturing Experience, taking place June 2nd through 4th, 2020 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thousands of manufacturers from across the country attend this event to learn benefits and implementation strategies for smart manufacturing. 
Demonstrate your advanced technologies to an audience eager for the latest innovations and know-how in Industry 4.0. Be the expert they turn to for answers. Smart Manufacturing Experience focuses on additive manufacturing in 3D printing, artificial intelligence, augmented and virtual reality, automation and robotics, cybersecurity, data analytics, industrial IoT, and workforce transformation. Be part of the experience. Visit bit.ly forward slash SME 2020 to become an experience partner. That's bit.ly forward slash SME 2020 to become an experience partner. Till next time, this is Future Grind.